if we do see uh, an increase in, in the number of inflows going to exchanges again, that could signal a, a potential strong upwards movement. I think most likely as we see a recovery um, where kind of valuations move back up to the, you know, 10K range. Today's crypto market discussion is sponsored by OKX. OKX, one of the leading crypto exchanges, has developed its own blockchain platform, OKChain, and recently has launched a test net. OKChain allows users to issue their own cryptocurrencies, create trading pairs, and trade freely on it. Watch this video and go check out OKChain. The link is in the description below. What's up, YouTube? My name is Jackson. Today, I'm joined by Simon Peters from eToro and David Greider from Fundstrat. How's it going today, guys? Yeah, good, thanks. Everything's good. Great. So Bitcoin has seen some incredible volatility in the past week. What are your targets for Bitcoin's next move? Right. If I look out over the next three, six months to 12 months, um, you know, I, see, I do see a number of scenarios and I can walk through kind of some of the data behind how we get to them. You know, that range between kind of a bear market, you know, to, to you know, around 2000, if we're if with the low probability um, a stagnant market, you know, maybe where you could see a, a some range where we sit kind of where we are with, you know, a, a minimal probability from my perspective around, you know, maybe 10, 15 percent. Um, I think most likely is we see a recovery um, where kind of valuations move back up to the, you know, 10 K range with, you know, multiple expansion on kind of some of the valuation models I look at which I put about 50% probability. And then, you know, there is some chance, um, you know, that you have a bull market in 20% range in my view, and then maybe a 5% probability you see another bull market um, similar to the one that we've seen in 2017, at like maybe a 5% probability. So I kind of handicap it in that, in that type of way. On March 16th, the Fed cut interest rates to nearly 0% in the face of coronavirus fears and stock market crashes. The European Central Bank's primary interest rate is already at 0%, and the Bank of England recently cut their interest rate by half a point to 0.25%. President Donald Trump has also introduced a $1 trillion stimulus plan to bolster the American economy. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. And I mean now in the next two weeks. While inflation continues to be the main tool used to combat the financial crisis, what role will Bitcoin play as the situation worsens? Uh, Simon, let's start with you. Yeah, I think at, at the moment, given what we have seen in the markets, um, it's what central banks and governments around the world have been doing is just trying to stop stop the bleeding, essentially. Um, we, we've, we've seen this, uh, this, this conversion of assets into cash, um, you know, regardless of which market it is. But there will come a point where due to this increasing um, amount that's been, that's been pumped into the system, that the cash is going to, it's going to lose its value. And then as the, the virus, no doubt, uh, stems down and the number of new cases that are being reported tails off, the question to investors is then, what do I do with all this cash that I have? And then they may look into to other assets that can um, hedge against that, essentially, with crypto possibly being one of them. I mean... If we go back to the, the, the whole idea of where, where Bitcoin was born from, it was, it was out of the financial crisis and the, uh, the distrust for banks as such and to provide a, an alternative uh, system for, 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 for you know, people to, to transact with each other without the need for a, a central party. So if you go back to those roots and I think the, the further we, we, we go down the line and um, the more people understand what's actually happening with their money going forward, then that may drive the, uh, the push into, the, into crypto, certainly. What are your feelings on this, David? You know, well, it's a really good question. I think that um, in the broadest sense, if you look at central bank easing and liquidity, um, you know, intuitively it should be inflationary for a number of assets, right? If you think about, you know, you're printing more dollars in the system, but you have to, you know, but you have to think about it more nuanced um, than that, which is that the reason that central banks are pumping excess liquidity into these systems is because you you know you have to offset when you have when you have um, you know dollars in the economy and then you have financial assets and you have asset values and asset values fall debt falls you're reducing the monetary um, supply in the economy right so if even if, if you're reducing that and you're offsetting it by increased um, central bank money you get to you get to somewhat of an equilibrium and, and you know I think that I'm not of the view that the dollar is um, in, in the position that it's going to weaken and, and Bitcoin is going to 
be strengthened because of because of money printing, right? You know, the, the U.S. is still the reserve currency. It is still the um, the place that globally a lot of capital flight in times of uncertainty is flowing to, and you can see that now. Treasuries have returned um, positively in the year, and the dollars returned positively in the years as the only two major asset classes, and everything else. At the same time, you could see a lot of you could see strength from from Bitcoin and crypto. You know, not necessarily from what the Fed's doing. Maybe part of it spills over, but I think you could see a lot of that from um, emerging market economies, um, other other nations where where you have you know capital flight that needs to. Um, exit the country. You know, I've seen a strong correlation between the, you know the Chinese capital account um, during times of their devaluation, um, you know, to Bitcoin's price. And you know, I think that that liquidity you can make it in to the markets, and you could also see a scenario where the dollar strengthens as well because of all the global uncertainty. So, um, I do think I think I do think on net it's I do think on net it's very positive for 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 crypto in general. Mm -hmm. And how do you guys feel that uh, the volatility of crypto is going to play into this whole idea? of at some point uh, Bitcoin or crypto becoming hedges against the, uh, the monetary system? Um, well, it's the, vol the volatility aspect, I suppose, takes away the idea of crypto being a safe haven. Um, you know, generally, safe havens are there to provide stability. Um, what I would say is if we, like I said, if we do see um, overall market liquidity proof and this volatility go down, then the case for it to be a, a, a safe haven could uh, greatly increase. How do you think the uh, current economic crisis will affect the Bitcoin halving? What effect will the decreasing inflation rate, which is fundamental to Bitcoin, have on Bitcoin's long-term success? Uh, Simon, would you like to start? Well, the crisis is not going to affect the halving because the halving is going to happen regardless. You know, it's programmed in, so we, we will see that happen. Um, in terms of long-term effects post-halving, um, Look, we know there's going to be a, a decrease in the block reward, which theoretically should decrease selling pressure from miners. So that's that's one aspect, and that could provide room for um, upward price increases. But there's a there's a lot more happening in in the world of crypto at the moment. Not even considering this virus um, to where we were four years ago from the last halving. So there's a lot more at play here, and uh, uh, a lot more factors that could suppress the price. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's there's, there's uh, futures markets, there's options markets now in Bitcoin. Some do argue that you know the whole purpose of this was to suppress the uh, the spot price of Bitcoin. That's that's a not an ongoing debate, but um, we're, we're at a very different stage in the um, in, in, in compared to where we were four years ago with the last one. Um, there's also uh, you know, same pressure from other from other means. Um, you know, you know this, this this plus token pyramid scheme that's ongoing at the moment where they're unloading significant quantities of Bitcoin and Ethereum onto the market. So at any point in time, I mean, we could just have um, significant set orders placed um, to suppress price. But I think in the longer term, my longer term outlook is um, is, is one of positive, um, bullish longer term. And uh, based on what we have seen historically, post-halving, um, a year, 18 months, 24 months, has tended to result in the, um, the top of the next bull market. So you feel that the uh, the coronavirus and the economic crisis isn't really going to uh, impact that long term bullish view? In in the long long term, I, I don't think so. No, because there will be a point where we we get to an end of this virus. Um, you know, like, as I mentioned, the, the the number of new cases already in China has actually started to to decrease, and we ha we haven't seen as many new cases develop there. So uh, once the Western world follows, or the, or the the, the world as a whole follows and we start to see these cases tail off, things should go back to normal. And um, you know, with, with the halving decreases in selling pressure and with this excess cash that's in the system right now that may provide the um, the right conditions for people to now consider crypto as a, an alternative asset and a means to uh, protect themselves against any future inflation. Yeah, so I'll just, just tack on one quick thing to the last thing I was talking about that um, Simon reminded me of um, when he talked about the economics of the economy and the GDP slowdown and, and, and the fundamental flow over to, to why stocks and bonds um, should see weakness makes sense, right? Um, but the economic fundamentals of, you know, Bitcoin and another of uh, monetary commodity proof of work cryptocurrencies um, and then most of the digital economy of crypto assets, right, like doesn't follow the same um, – you know, economic fundamentals, meaning, right, like it's not about necessarily economic activity, GDP growth and, and um, you know, you know, earnings for the for the most part. The halvening has been shown in, in our view, right, at Fundstrat, Tom's view is that the, the halvening is bullish for Bitcoin. 
right? Like that's the punchline. But you know, how do how do you get there, right? Like Tom's um, done a lot of good work on on what the net reduction in supply is on the market from from minor selling, right? And as a supply demand asset, you know that is positive if you look at what that means um, for 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 new supply coming onto the market, right? Um, and I think from from a demand side, you know, on narrative economics, um, Robert Schiller has a very good book, Narrative Economics, and it talks about how stories drive investment themes in way in the ways that market behave. And and and, and I buy into that, and I believe that because there has been such success with prior happenings, that you will likely get some cohort of investors who say, "Look at that," and then they say, "Okay, you know." Let's 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 see if history plays out again. And, and right, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And um, you know, I think that that's very likely too. Um, you know, from another fundamental perspective, it's like as well, like it's not also just the number of new supply in the market, right, that determines the price. It's also existing holders who have the ability to sell. And again, you know, we mentioned most of those are underwater. So you know, as you have you know a reduction in the current new supply, right, at current market prices coming onto the market. Because that's the cost that it costs to mine and that marginal cost, marginal um, revenue to miners, right? And then you have a new demand from from a narrative, and then you have reduction in demand, right? That's not going to come on the market from the existing supply, less likely because they're underwater, right? Until it reaches again above peak levels, you know. I think that that's a strong combination for for prices to move higher, um, and that's that's kind of the, the the framework under which you know I'm looking at the having and we're looking at the having and thinking about what what that could mean for prices going forward. So in a recent report, blockchain and crypto analytics firm Chainalysis found that large increases of Bitcoin inflows on exchanges are a good indicator of volatility. Transfers of 10 to 100 and 100 to 1,000 Bitcoin were in total responsible for around 70% of all Bitcoin sent and received by exchanges in recent days. This suggests that professional investors and traders were driving the market, even though they were joined in selling and buying by a large number of retail holders. How can this information help us anticipate future price action? Um, I mean, we, we've, we have vision of uh, inflows and outflows anyway. So um, I think if we do see uh, an increase in, in the number of inflows going to exchanges again, that could signal a, a potential strong upwards movement. Um, so I think yeah, the community is always looking to see what the inflows and outflows are and to ascertain the, 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 the movements that could happen, if that makes sense. So. Um, I mean, going forward, yeah, that'd be uh, key key uh, metrics to have. So, you know, w w when I look at that and I think about kind of what the market dynamic is um, that's driving the price right now, um, I'm going to add another data point, which is that um, the majority of those inflows that have been moving into exchanges now have been um, really largely coins that have been recently moved, um, newer coins, newer holders, um, not long term holders. And if you if you take it from the perspective that you have both newer holders, you know, over the last year, let's just say, as opposed to five years, you know, um, you know, which is post the the, the bubble we've seen and, and kind of the onboarding of a, a larger, broader institutional class. Um, you know, if, if I think about that investor demographic, right, and what their incentives are driving this market, you know, we've seen contagion, generally speaking, from all financial markets across the globe to all financial assets. And, you know, I think it's, 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 it's probably very likely that the subset of the market that's, that's been possibly responsible for those inflows has been a traditional, um, investment class broadly exposed to the market that maybe needs to, you know, delever. And that is part of the selling pressure, right? As opposed to early holders getting scared out. Now, what, what is the impact for retail, right? The, the impact for retail is, um, you know, if you ever have a market move like this, um, you, you get liquidity. Uh, issues and you get structural deleveraging, uh, meaning like when when there's large flows and, and, and large gaps down because of you know some selling pressure and people aren't willing to buy just because of general broad panic and across all asset classes, then then you get deleveraging like you've seen on Bitmex. You know you've seen the open interest fall from you know six six billion seven billion down to where we are around two three. You you see deleveraging from um, a number of you know platforms where. Where people can can trade with leverage, um, not just with futures, and then you see deleveraging from a lot of the um, borrowing and lending markets, and that has that cascading effect, right? So I think that that's kind of you know in combination holistically what I'm what I'm seeing when I think about 
you know, how the market's been moving and been driving from, from, from that, those types of inflows into exchanges. So you feel that most of the professional traders and investors have already gotten out of crypto and that's what we've seen in the past like 10 days or so? Well, it depends how you define professional, right? Like, um, I think generally speaking, there can be an early class probably of what, you know, you would call crypto native, like crypto whales, right? To, to use the term, right? And I think that to a large degree, you know, they probably still dominate the majority of what's considered the float, meaning the float being the supply actively traded and available, you know, on exchanges that people can buy and sell, right? Because the more, you know, the marginal liquidity in any market, right, isn't isn't the volume you see, right? Like if you look at the total supply on like coin aging data, you can see you get somewhere between like maybe 1% to a few percent of the total supply that's ever traded, right? And, and that's what really moves the price. Right. And then that supply can be turned over a bunch of times and then that's the volume. Right. So what is what is the what is that supply base? You know, who holds that in aggregate? Right. And I think that probably, you know, you've seen an, an onboarding in, in, in 2016, 2017 of a traditional, probably institutional, maybe a fund class to some degree, but not very large. Right. But, you know, still prior to that, this was a very small market. And I think that it's still probably, you know, mostly dominated by by early, larger, um, you know, crypto whales. Right. And then. If you think about, you know, what's happened in the last downturn, right, I think it's possible that a lot of these traditional folks who have been, you know, what you'd call traditional institutional investors have been maybe flushed out kind of like the retail audience was in, in, in December of 18, but not not necessarily due to Bitcoin's reasons, but due to some of the structural reasons across the broader market, right? Like if, if you know, you're, you're a fund manager and you're holding, um, let's just say a basket, you, hold your, you have your stock allocation, you have your bonds. You're getting margin called on a number of leverage positions across your portfolio, right? Depending on your strategy, right? Like you need you need a rush for cash, not just for the sake of, of you know, individually investing in this asset class, Bitcoin, right? And what, what kind of circumstances would have to be in place for per professional traders and investors to lose their ability to drive the market? I don't think they'll lose their ability to to move the market. I think that's, that's always going to be there for them. What I would say is that at this moment in time, the... Um, the, the market, the crypto market, that is, is to a degree quite uh, illiquid, and the, the the total liquidity of the crypto market is spread across various exchanges. It's, it's very, it's fragmented at the moment. So, it does mean that with a um, uh, a, a large market order, you know, the, the market can spike significantly one way or the other, depending on which way you want to move it, pretty much. So, once um, exchanges perhaps come together and this liquidity deepens, then it may be that um, large orders like this that we have been seeing may not have such an impact on price action going forward. So to, to sort of answer your question, uh, yeah, as the liquidity improves and more people do get involved in the ecosystem, it could well be that um, the market orders that we have seen may not have such an influence on the market anymore. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this, David? You know, I think, I think when you talk about who drives the market at any given time, it's... Um, it's, it's a dynamic question, right? Because again, price is always set by the marginal line of liquidity, right? And, you know, as Simon rightfully mentioned, um, liquidity in, in Bitcoin and crypto is probably less than most people think, um, just given some of the, you know, the reported volumes, um, when you think on a fundamental basis, right? Like, like on that turnover, right? So, 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 you know, who really drives the market at any given time? can be a mix of factors, right? Like, and people can buy and sell for many reasons. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily phrasing it the right way. Um, but when I think about what drives the market, right, I think, I think what drives the market in aggregate is probably um, a number of factors, like, you know, I think structural reasons drive the market right now. I think that it's like, you know, the supply demand dynamics we've seen from, um, Deleveraging, right, which which force shorts. I think that that's one thing that squeezes a lot of people out and forces a lot of pressure. I think when you get a lot of underwater holders um, that are restricted from supply side that don't sell because they're underwater, which is 50% of the supply, as I saw um, in some other data, you get a lot of, you know, lacks in selling. And then that can create some 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 scenarios where, you know, you, you don't need a ton of marginal demand to drive the market, right? And then if you get some catalysts in place, and we see a number from from our point of view, um, you know, which which, you know, one could be, um, you know, the happening, um, I can talk about it in a second, because I know, you, you know, that's probably some touch on. Um, another one could be some, some geopolitical risks that we see more broadly on the horizon. And we think that that still plays a role. Um, another would be, 
you know, central bank liquidity um, globally um, being being added into the system. And then, you know, I think, um, you know, another kind of thing that can take off some stress on the market could be the elections as well. You know, this, this is some, some very um, thoughtful views from Tom uh, Lee and in that, you know, the, the, the White House will be less focused on, on crypto regulation, perhaps if, if we're lucky. So um, I think that that's kind of, you know, when you think about what drives the market, it's, 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 a, it's a bigger picture than, than kind of just, you know, whether it's retail or professional or in, the, in that way, I think is the way I view it. Uh, one suggestion you would like to make for our viewers, for anyone who's looking to uh, survive or take advantage of this financial crisis that we're currently in, what is one thing that you would suggest to them? For, from my perspective on the crypto side, on the investment side, you know, I think prices right now for Bitcoin um, particular and crypto in general um, are at cheap. When I look at fundamental valuation levels based on some models that I have are ch at cheap prices that we haven't seen since, um, you know, tw uh, you know, December of 2018. And then we haven't seen these prices again since December of 2016. Right. So from that perspective, if you have a long term view, six, to 12 months, you know, I'm, I'm bullish there as well, right? So I think that that's kind of a, a framework that I would use for thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Simon, do you have a suggestion you would like to give our viewers? Yeah, just, just echoing what David said. I think uh, in terms of uh, my own conversations with clients here at eToro, the first thing I ask them is what's your, what's your personal objective and you know, are you, you know, because that would dictate what your, what your strategy is and ultimately what assets you should be investing into. And if you have a, a short-term outlook, then perhaps uh, you know, riskier assets like, uh, equities, arguably crypto, um, are perhaps not the, the things you should be looking to get into right now. You, you, you want to think more about capital preservation and uh, a little return rather than um, higher risk. But if you have a longer term outlook, then you can afford these uh, these swings in the market. And we have seen over time, uh, if you look at stock markets over, over history in the, the financial crisis or the dot-com bubble, um, if you had bought at the top of those, then or well, maybe not so much uh, given the couple of weeks, but um, before that, you know, we're, we're still higher than where we were then. So if, if your outlook's long enough, then you can afford to take greater and greater risk. Great. Thank you guys for coming on the show. It was amazing to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks for having us. That was Simon from eToro and David from Fundstrat. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. And guys, always remember to hodl. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.